it's really quite comfortable fabric to wear. Um, there's several other hemp's, so linen is a hemp, um, and any any other natural long fiber that is used whole, is they call that a hemp. But this is cannabis hemp, and this is different in the fact that it's got multiple uses. So the stalk can be used as a building material quite readily. The um, flowers can be used for um, for fun or for medicine. They've got many, many uses on many things. I make a lot of um, topical ointments and, and uh, infusions and, and things like that. Different plants and different, using hemp, a hemp base because of the endocannabinoid system, but different other plants that are used with it. So uh, synergy, plant synergy, where it's, they, it's spoken about as the um, entourage effect, but really it's just plant synergy and it's how different parts of a plant can work together. And plants share a lot in common. They have different different chemical structures. So. Okay. Is that better? I think it was better, the other one. Yeah, we'll stick with that one. Uh, okay, so look, the, the, probably one of the most fascinating plants of the parts of the plant is how it fits, not just with humans, but with all our, all creatures. All anything but a heartbeat has an affinity to cannabis. has a has a system in their body that uses cannabis to balance itself, and. We make endocannabinoids in our own body. Our own body produces them. The plant produces lots of them. But strangely enough, they, they're exactly the same in all animals, and cannabinoids are taken into the body of animals the same way, and that is used for exactly the same thing in balancing, called homeostasis. And that's the most, for me, that's the most fascinating part of the plant, that it's chosen a chemical root to be useful to all creatures and what keeps cannabis as a sacred plant I guess and as such a useful plant well is that is its usefulness and it has affinity with us human beings and our pets and livestock etc yeah so that's I don't know that's an impromptu hello and my team didn't turn up so any questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's been it's used as a fodder. It's used as a fodder crop. You can't legally use it as a fodder crop at the moment. That's because of the way things are, but that's just the silliness of the situation. But yes, it makes a perfectly good fodder. It needs to be mixed down with other things. You can't use it just straight, they won't like it. Mixing it, turning it into silage with molasses is a really good way of using it. Works very well that way. Um, don't tell them. It works for me. Uh, look, I think, uh, so I've got a license to grow, to grow hemp, and so I can grow hemp and it's fine. But previous years when I was growing it illegally, you just had to play under the radar. But that was, this, this whole community, its economy has been based on cannabis. It's, you know, like most of us have bought our land and sent our kids to schools off the back of the cannabis, the same as off the back of the sheep, you know, back in the old day. And it's just the way that it works. It's, it's an alternative economy that doesn't rely on anything outside at all. It's really quite interesting. And it's worked really well for this community.
Great question. Yeah, so that is really the big issue with growing the crop hemp. What are you going to do with it once you've grown it? You have to break open, because there's been no industry in it, we've had to break open the industry. So we have to produce things and sell them and market them and make a return from it. But it's been really very much cottage industry. So we and suck it and see, you know, try it, see how it goes. And luckily, we've come across some really good products and really popular products that people want. So we're getting there, but there is no industry for it yet. We're building that. And we're doing it on a, we're doing it on a village level here, on a, a very small community level. So it's slow. But it's working, and if it works here, then there's no reason why it won't work, and there's no reason why it can't get bigger. But we've got to start somewhere, and this is, this is where we're at at the moment. It's been a really good journey, and we've had some great successes, but a long way to go. Me personally, I'm an outdoor grower. Yeah, I just fertilise the soil, use a lot of lime. I like dolomite. So a good, strong, rich dolomite and then whatever animal fertiliser you want to throw in there as well. And then you plant your seeds about yay deep. Get rid of the weeds, get rid of the cover. If you can have bare soil to plant into, it's ideal. Or a cover crop that grows along with it. And plant them in about yay deep at the right time of year and it should be, if you've got good seed, you should have no problem at all. Depending on what you're trying to achieve. So if you want to achieve a flower, you're probably going to plant them two, two metres apart. If you're going to grow a shirt, you're probably going to plant them an inch apart. It's it, horses for courses. Hmm? And treat them like any other plant. Give them what they want. Give them the food they want. Balance the soil. Nature does the rest. What method do you use? <laughs> Much the same. Yeah. So China produces virtually all of the hemp material on the planet. It just does. And you know, they they never stop growing it. So when we turned it into a crime. They just kept on going. And they, all their military uniforms are made from hemp. Their gun stocks are made from hemp. Their boots are made from hemp. It's all hemp. They, live in a, they have a hemp economy that's thriving over there. And they sell us their rejects and you know, their machinery for how to deal with it and the rest. And, but they've, they've jealously guarded hemp that whole time that it was illegal. And it's been a boon for them. It's been wonderful for them. Their farmers do very well from it. And it's a very expensive fabric to buy. You know, like this, this one here, we wove this. This, this was woven by, by my family. My, my wife and her family wove it and sewed the shirt from it and stuff like that. But I think we're probably, I think we are actually unique on the planet for doing that. Growing, um, weaving broadloom hemp by hand is done nowhere else in the world except in Thailand, where they do a, it's not broad, it's quite narrow. They do a, a, a narrow fabric. So I think that my little, my little family group are unique and we're growing and making our own hemp clothing right, right from scratch. This is a pretty interesting thing. Are you selling it here? Yep, we've got uh, fabric up at the co-op and uh, at the hemp co-op and uh, down at THC, uh, the hemp club, THC. Cotton. Just straight cotton? Yeah, cotton, linen cotton. And you need a special needle because you keep blunting, blunting the needle to the sewing machine. Oh, yeah. So I just wondered if you used a different tensile measure. Uh, I'd have to ask my wife. Um, that's way above my pay scale. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Well, you can't hear, but so we weave it. I weave it over in Cambodia, where my wife comes from. So we weave it there, and we're able to. We were able to do it for about. We we pay about a dollar fifty a metre to weave it. So they can weave maybe two or three metres in a day. So that's 
that's sort of their rate of pay, and we pay bonuses and shit like that. But and it's family, so it doesn't really. It's not really a wage dependent thing. But no, the truth is you can't. You couldn't hand weave it or hand make it economically. No. No, we do, we do a variety, like we've been experimenting with different methods. So some of our stuff we've exported fibre over there and, and had it um, spun there and other, other uh, yarn we bought from China. Oh, we, just a few little trial efforts, yes. Yeah. It's not economic. It's not economic, but it's just a proof, it's a proof of concept that it can be done and it could, of course, be mechanised. You know, it's great fabric, really useful. I like it a lot. No, not really. The, the biggest problem with growing it is having an end use for it. So it's pr so easy to grow. You know, I could grow, I could grow 100 hectares quite easily. But then, what am I going to do with it? I don't spray anything at all. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So we're we're working on that. We're making um, we're making hemp panels using the the whole stem of the plant. So uh, we're putting in a, a magnesium matrix, taking the whole stem of the plant, soaking it in the in lime and boron, and using the whole thing. So it's very little processing. You're just soaking it and then you're placing it into your wall. And the wall's flat on the ground. It's in a slip form. So we lay down a layer of magnesium cement, which comes from Australia, and then we lay the, the, the sticks into it and put another layer of magnesium cement over the top, then lay the other way and ply it. And we got a seven ply material, which seems to be load bearing. It hasn't been tested yet, but we're making them in two 2.5 metre long panels, about yay wide. And yeah, it's looking good. We're not there but it's looking good and it'll only ever be proof of concept because that kind of building really takes, to do it efficiently, you need big space and big machinery. You've got to industrialize it a bit and we're not up for that. So we can do proof of concept and then when it works, get it okayed and whatnot and then it's up, you know, it's gonna to have to be, be talking millions, but yeah, it's, it's a doable thing. Well, you just don't tell them. No, you know. but when you do transferring to legalisation, is it a hard concept to go through? You know, do they really do and, you know, there are hundred red lines that you have to, or you have to jump through? I think, look, I, th like I think they, it, because it's new for the authorities too, the legal side of it, they sort of, they've only got a vague grasp of what's going on. Yeah. I, I think. Yeah. You know, like the... They didn't have any idea of the uses we could put hemp to when we started growing it. And now this, now we've got all these things happening, you know, we've got clothing and we, as building materials beginning to come along. Martin's been making some fantastic carbon fibre material out of it, Martin Ernick. Um, I think um, we've got a man here in the back making skateboards out of it. No? No? Wrong one. We got a guy in the village here who's who's uh, making skateboard ramps out of it and got funding to do that. So we yeah, we're moving we're moving up. Yeah, well, yes, it's expensive. It's expensive paper if you're making it by hand again. If you 
<laughs> to do it by hand, we do, but not to make commercial amounts of bleach white paper, which is sort of what people want. There's a really nice, um, in the hallway, if, if you're going into the hallway, into the hall, there's a, on the right hand side, there's a 2.6 metre by 1 metre sheet of hemp paper, and it's beautiful. It's really lovely, which we've made, but it's not commercial. It's an artwork, but as commercially, no, nothing like it. Yeah, oh yeah. Yes. Yeah, in a word, yeah. We've we've given away all our ability to make things. So we're learning again. We're starting from scratch. It'll come in time. I think it'll be forced on us. But for now, we're going to stick with wood chip paper, I guess. So depending on what I'm growing, if I'm growing for flour, I'll take cuttings. So I'll, I'll, I'll plant clones. If I'm growing for, um, for fibre, I, I just want a thick cover of seed. So yeah, seed drill, just drill them very close together. Totally depends on the on what you're growing. So, um, again, well, the plant that I'm growing at the moment is a really long-term plant. It lasts seven months. It's probably seven months in the ground. Yeah, King G. So that's a hemp plant, and it's um, it's got a really high CBD resin content in the flower, which is why I like to grow it. It's got so many other uses besides being a really vigorous plant, but it's got a very long life. It's in the ground for maturing for six to seven months, which is a lot. So you can grow an industrial crop in 100 days. So the ones that you're planting close together, you'll get two crops a year. In this area, you'll get two crops a year. And um, there'll be 100, day, 100 to 110 days germinating to finishing which is pretty good. So if you can make 10 grand out of a hectare from your fibre, from the fibre side of it, and you can do that twice a year, that's an all right return from a, from a hectare, as far as a broad acre farmer goes. It's all right. Mm. And if you can improve product on other parts of the plant, which you certainly can. So the flower is where the money is. You know, like if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you're extracting for medicinal uses or cosmetic uses, then there's quite a lot of money in the flower. So it makes it worthwhile. And then if you're making another 10 grand on top of that per hectare off your, off your waste. But it sort of doesn't work like that. You have to aim for what it is that you want to grow. So if you were... Very intentional. If you were growing for flour, for instance, you wouldn't make $10,000 out of fibre out of your plants because they'd be too spaced too far apart. Hmm. But... And horses for courses too. There's other seeding plants I'm playing with right now is a plant called Yuma. And that grows in a single stem with a thick head of, of densely packed seed on the top. And it's it, quite good. It's, we're getting about four ounces of seed from one single stem. <coughs> Which is a lot, especially when, you, when your plants are this far apart. It's just, uh, and I think hemp seed is worth probably to the farmer about five dollars a kilo. If you, if, you cook, if you chill it, put it in a cool room, years, years. Five years, no worries. I've got seed at home that's five years old and, and I'll plant it and it'll, it'll be fine. As soon as it gets warm, it, it'll start to go off. So you've got to keep it chilled. It, it, normally it'll last about a year. You kept out of the fridge or whatever, but refrigerate it and yeah, you get years out of it. Um, so as far as like sourcing seeds um, for, for a backyard grower, for example, is that difficult to do or is it something where you ask the outgrowers for industrial use? 
in the embassy. Yeah. Hemp embassy. You get some seed from them. Yeah. It seems to be the answer. It, yeah, the embassy's great. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a, an outlet for so many things while it's been illegal, and now that they're becoming legal, it's a, you know it's the place to go to to get stuff. I think it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, good question. The, the hemp plant seems to be a net benefit to the soil, particularly if you leave the stubble in. It seems to balance it pretty well and hold it together. It also improves the texture and the vitality of the soil. But you do have to, you do have, if you're taking out, you've got to put back in. You know, you just can't take it, take it out all the time. But having said that, there's a lot of magic going on between the, the sunlight and the and the soil organisms and everything in between that is building minerals and cleating minerals and catching minerals out of, out of the air and putting them into the soil. So that's sort of a carbon sequestration kind of idea. Yeah, and I found so on my plot where I've been growing cannabis for five years now, so five, six, seven, eight, ten crops through that soil, it's really good soil. And the only thing I've added back into it is every couple of years I'll put in some uh, dolomite. That's the only additive I've given it. And mm, no, I ha actually haven't given it any fertilizer at all. I haven't been fertilizing at all. I've been thinking about it, but uh, I just don't do it. Too lazy. And... So not even, not even yeah, yeah, cover crops are great. Absolutely, yeah. Rye grass, millet, oats. All of these things are fantastic and they do put back in and you dig them back in or as um, Leon Leon does he he grows a cover crop and then just knocks it over presses it and plants straight into the cover crop fantastic it is a, a living mulch it's fantastic great idea and so many other ideas rye grass beautiful you know what a lovely thing and you dig that back in and it brings the soil up yeah of course companion yeah Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, you've got to abs absolutely grow cover crops to put back in. How do you go with pests? Do you have any issue with pests? Uh, depending on what you're growing for again, but no except for the flower late in the season, and that's caterpillars. And that's that's really the only that's the only pest we've had. And how do you mitigate that? Do you have to spray the plant with anything or net them? Or? Yeah, you can do... It, molasses seems to work pretty well. Okay. But um, failing that, there's a few things on the market you can spray with. There's a, one called Success, which I believe isn't, hasn't got many um, side effects. Is that BT? Mm. It's a, uh, a scientific name, it's like a living everywhere. So it's it's like a fungus. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a natural fungus, I believe. So. Do you personally use any sacrificial crops to turn into one off, though? No. So, for spider mite, for example, you have the other one. Oh, that's in, that's that's in inside growing, really the spider mites. I've never had out, outdoors. I've never had problem with spider mites. Oh yeah, yeah. Look, the, if you've got a good natural biome going on and a good life system, they should that shouldn't be a problem outdoors. As far as I know, that only really happens with indoor growth and you know inside lights and stuff. Hmm. Yeah, it's a pretty good question, and we get tripped up by it a few times. But you're supposed to uh, tell the DPI when you're growing a crop. You, know, you have to. You registered, and then you say, "I planted at this stage," and la la la. And it's supposed to protect you, but it doesn't really. They still, they still come in and occasionally take some. DPI and the drug squad to get to communicate. <laughs> 
Yes. I think that's right. Sorry? Any pointers on improving the flower? Oh, yeah. Um, no. Uh, just let it be. Yeah, I, well, I like to do that. Yeah. You know, the, often the less you do is the best. That guy that wrote the One Straw Revolution, he was just a lazy man. He was a lazy man. He said, look, just don't do anything and let it take care of itself. It seems to work out. I mean, you've got to be nice to it, but... Don't, don't, don't give it too many, don't baby it along too much. So, yeah, look, if I, was, if I was growing a medicinal crop and I was actually growing a plant to have big luscious heads, yeah, I'd give it lots of, lots of natural fertiliser in the soil. But for the industrial crop, not at all. Not at all. It's, and really the industrial crop is more relevant because it takes up so much space. For the amount of medicinal plants there are, there's just not many. You know, or, or, or illegal plants, there's just not that many of them. It's little patches of a few plants, it's not a big deal. When you're talking hectares, now you're talking. Now you're talking making differences in the ecosystem and yeah, yeah. I think it's a really useful plant for putting back in. Not that I know of. Not that I know of. No. So you mentioned before that over five years you've had ten crops, which over an outdoor cycle that five years will usually take to five seasons. How are you going with that? So you mentioned that you're doing an industrial sale. No, I'm growing an industrial crop, but I'm not doing it on an industrial scale. Yeah. So, are you, are you using drip? Are you using greenhouses where you're still controlling the photo period? Or are you using water flowers that allow, or are you, are you growing from clone that are automatically under 24 hour photo period? So, as soon as you bring them out, they automatically flower. How, how are you achieving two cycles per year outdoors? So, if you've got a if you've got a um, a crop that takes a hundred days to finish, so you start in early in the spring, yep. or even late winter, yep. you start your first crop. That'll come through a hundred days later. That's done, and then harvest and replant. So, what's the, the overall purpose of your crops? Is that for smoke pools? Is that for No, mostly R and D. So I'm, I'm really, I'm really trying to figure out different uses for it as that we can use on a village level. So really, the crops I grow, they're not big enough to. Maybe I'd grow a couple of hectares in a year. So it's just not industrial size, but I am making industrial use of it. Yeah, everything. We, it, I'm, I'm using, I'm, I'm trying to achieve everything. I'm trying to open up different areas that we can do on a, a on a, a, a village cottage farming level. Okay. Something, that, something that you don't need a hundred acres to work with, and you don't need a bank loan to begin. It's different, but that's a different. It depends on what you're growing for. So if you, so if you're growing for flower, then you're probably going to have auto flower. You're probably going to have all these other. You probably use lights, different things. But 
if you, it's again, it's just depending on what you're going for. But if we're talking completely industrial, just I'm just going for industrial use to make walls, to make shirts, whatever. Then every hundred days you plant. That's where I was confused as well. That's why I went before I asked, are you using a bee doing it for smokeballs as well as industrial purposes? I do it for everything. Yeah. But 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 in minuscule quantities. You know, I mean, the, the, a couple of hectares. How much damage can I cause? <laughs> How do you get your seed? Do you have like a seed crop that you do every year? Yeah, I grow my seed. Yeah. Hey, yeah, in a in a discreet area. A little bit off the topic, but I once saw a man down here making solar panels using hemp for charcoal or something. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, that's pretty arcane. So that's graphene. That's the using the, that's using the lignans in the plant, and cooking them at huge temperatures with no oxygen and turning them into turning them into graphene or a graphene-like substance. But yeah, we're not we're not up for that yet. Maybe next year. So when you're going through your seed cycle as well, and do you care of its sex? Do you care if you have male and female plants within your crops? Depending on what I'm growing it for. If I'm growing it for flour, uh, yeah, males, you know, not welcome. What are your thoughts on feminised seeds? Do you think it eventually breeds in hematocytic? Look, it depends on how you do it. You can chemically achieve it, or you can uh, you can naturally achieve it. You can get you can you can create a, a feminised seed in your plant by keeping males away from it, but growing it on so it's perfectly healthy. Every now and again, if you do the right things to it and the chemical you use is the chemical that's given off by rotting fruit. So that's that's the thing that triggers... Well, I don't know, I'd have to look that one up, but it's something like that. But that's what triggers the female plant to put out what appears to be a male pistol and fertilise itself. Well, if it'll only get fertilised, it'll self-fertilise, but it'll self-fertilise with a double X chromosome because there's no, there's no Y chromosome in, in the event. So you end up with, you end up with a, 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 all your seed it w will only be feminine. It's only got the X chromosome in there. Um, I, you can take them any time, but preferably before they begin to head. Yeah, and um, take it from the softer part of the plant, not when, not where it gets woody. So, but that's yeah, it's a it's a bit of an art. You do it a lot of times, so have a lot of failures, and it comes right. Yeah. But, Yep, honey. When you are taking your cutting, what's part of so what form of cutting process are you doing in the sense of what's your medium? Are you using honey? Ah, uh, so that's your rooting, that's your sterilization and your rooting uh, engine, I suppose. But do you do are you using like your UBTI or are you using Jiffy pots, just peat moss. Yeah, but thanks to China, there's a lot of small machinery we can get straight from China that covers it because they do it there and they do it cheaply there. So it's been useful. China's been very useful in, in our progressing with the hemp thing. So yeah, we've got a lot of, a lot of things, decorticators, which strips the bark off the, off the stem. You know, you can get one of those from China for about three grand. So that's, that's pretty good. All the, those things are okay.
No, not yet. They've, um, they've got some big grants up in Queensland, I believe. But no, nothing here yet. No, we just get, um, we just get regulated. Yep, absolutely. We just, we, but we do need the big machinery to do it, and we're a long way from that. I don't think I don't think government's relevant. I think we need I think we need um, yeah, big business. I don't know. I just don't trust big business. You know, like we've got to trust ourselves here. Yeah. Well, we've done that. We've got a, we've got the co-op up here, and we've applied for a grant, but we got, we got knocked back. Oh, it just didn't fit the criteria they were looking for. It'll come, but it shouldn't. It really isn't that relevant. We've got to, do, we've got to learn to do this ourselves, and we, I can do. Um, Proof of concept stuff. I can do little small scale things, and and working with the geniuses around here, I can I can get these things happening. But really, only in tiny. Yeah, it'd be handy, it'd be handy. But then, yeah, it, you're sort of pushing a piece of string, you know. Like until until the demand for the thing is there, the people, aren't, the farmers aren't going to plant the seed, and it's. It's that cycle that you've got to you've got to prime. So by creating, I hope hopefully by creating different things, we'll get those things primed, and they'll grow from there. And yeah, I'm happy with where we are. You know, we could be we could be a lot more further advanced, but I'm pretty happy with where we are. We're go, we're coming along. All right, guys. Well, that was a pleasure for me. I was. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your interest. <laughs>
Thanks to the glory of uh, being able to buy your own saliva swipe tests. Now the saliva swipe tests go down to 12 nanograms and the first swipe on the police is 10 nanograms so we're splitting a molecule here. Um, and if you take a capsule that's clean obviously, swallow it in your mouth, have a mouthful of water, swallow it so it's not touching anything. Guaranteed, because uh, the study's been proven now, you can test yourself two hours, five hours at 20 milligrams up to about 120 milligrams and you will still be negative clear to drive. Obviously you'll be absolutely stoned at 120 grams. You will be uh, greened out and vomiting. If you vomit, regurg or have blood in your mouth, you will have THC, as in gingivitis. So it does pay to have one of those water blasters on your gums. They're called water pickers. Oh, go on. And, um, and that way um, it strengthens your gums, you don't bleed, you'll be clean. So this is a very handy tip to know. Uh, if you're an everyday smoker, you probably, I don't know, you can, I'll come saliva test you and you can tell me how you go. But if you're... Daisy! Daisy, get you now. Oh, my dog's running away. <laughs> Shelly, you're going to have to find Daisy, she's running down the road now, she's lost. She's going up north, follow the people. Okay. Well, anything that uh, touches the mouth is what we're interested in, okay? So if you've got blood, regurge or vomit, reflux, you're going to be tested positive. If you swallow a capsule, guarantee you won't be positive. As long as you haven't got gingivitis, reflux or vomit. Uh, average tote that you're going to take, you're getting 30 to 50 milligrams, even though if you're rolling up about 120 milligrams, but you're just wasting that in the air. So if you green out of 120 and it's been proven, you'll be clean, as long as you don't vomit reflux as well. So you take capsules? Of capsules of THC, I'm talking about. And you heard of those, you're okay? Yes. You're not going to get done by these. Right, now if you doubt me, I would like you to go, you can buy these saliva tests online, they're, they're worth it. And if anyone's really scared or if they want to try their masking technique, come see me, I've got a few, we can test you before you go. Well, again, the studies that I've looked at, and these are, this is first-hand knowledge, uh, capsules going from 20 milligrams up to 120 milligrams in total. In other words, take six of them if you want it. You will green out. You won't be able to walk off, you know, like it'll be overkill. But the point is, you will be negative on the saliva. As long as you haven't got blood in the gums, reflux or vomit. Because THC is fat lipid friendly, it's not in water. So it's not going to come into your saliva unless it's onto your tongue, vomit, blood, reflux. Or if you're eating a cookie or smoking, obviously you're going to have that on you. So what would you say, say I had a smoke, I was going to try I would say safe driving first, obviously, um, and then masking, I, I can't make a comment because we all have the rumours, you know, hearsay, fishermen's friends, this, that, aqua gels, vinegar, and the list is endless. Go buy yourself a saliva testing kit and prove it for yourself if your masking technique works or not. So is it like metabolised, like blood alcohol, like, is it like a metabolism? So when the police catch you on the side of the road for a saliva detection, it's not about unsafe driving, um, it's only because you've had THC in the form of a food, a smoke or a vape and you put it on your tongue. So it's just physically there, it's not... Correct. So if you put it up the anus, if you inject it into the bloodstream, um, if you swallow it in a capsule but you don't touch your mouth, you'll be clean as long as you don't have blood, vomit or reflux. In fact, that was actually acknowledged in a court case as well, uh, where the uh, police prosecutor scientist actually acknowledged that fact as well. So, it's, but I, you know, I had to prove it, and so you don't want hearsay. There's a lot of gossip. So go buy saliva testing kits. THC. They go down to 12 nanograms. Anyway, enjoy your combi drive, guys, and don't forget the psilocybin and John Jiggins, eh? Kicking off at six.
Daisy ran crazy looking for you. But that's Daisy. I've got, I'm sure I've got